It's sort of interesting how quickly society has come to rely on new technologies. Um, and it seems like there's this sort of cultural assumption of this ubiquity of new technology. Um, and in computer science, um, is this in focus? Um, well, so I'll let someone else with that. Um, in computer science, something I hear some of the times is people say computers can do anything. Um, and admittedly, this is a little bit of a straw man. Um, people don't actually say this, but people are really excited about what computers can do. And it's not that difficult to understand why that is, because if you look at the performance of computers over the last decade or two decades or 50 years, um, there's this steady trend up that keeps going. Um, and people keep complaining about how it's tailing off, but we're still getting 20% a year. And if you go back and um, calculate how much performance improvement we've got um, by comparing like a computer like the ENIAC from 1940 versus today's number one supercomputer, there's 13 orders of magnitude difference in performance in the last 70 years. And I don't know any other field that has accomplished anything even remotely like that, especially like in this short time period. And the thing that's perhaps even more surprising about it is how this quantitative change has led to a qualitative change in what we've been able to do. Um, but the mistake that we tend to make when we look at these changes is that we like to generalize and say, well, we're going to be able to do anything in the future. And of course, this has to be wrong. Um, and what I want to talk about today is about how actually some of these problems are not just difficult, but they're actually provably impossible to solve. Um, of course, as a Christian, this perhaps shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Um, in the book of Job, uh, the book talks about this man, Job, who goes through all this suffering, and then at the end, God comes to him and basically says, um, like, you don't have any idea what I'm really doing behind the scenes. Um, and Christians maybe have a tendency to use this to say, like, we don't, <clears throat> um, like, academics shouldn't be doing their research because, you know, God doesn't need these academics. Um, what I want to focus on here is more uh, <clears throat> that there are obviously things that we can't do, but what are those things? Like, what can we show is actually impossible to do. Um, and so I'm going to define an impossibility theory to be the study of the impossible rather than the possible, sort of flipping the normal um, investigation of science. And the goal of doing this is to help us better understand the limits of knowledge and therefore of human capability. Now, the idea itself isn't actually new. In mathematics, this idea has been around for a while. Um, in <clears throat> around 1900, David Hilbert gave a talk where he outlined 10 problems that would go on to shape the next century in mathematics. And during this talk, he said that occasionally it happens that we seek the solution to some mathematical problem under insufficient hypotheses or in an incorrect sense, and for this reason do not succeed. The problem then arises to show the impossibility of the solution under the given hypotheses or in the sense contemplated. And he goes on to say that he believes that every problem in math is either solvable or provably impossible to solve. And I'm not necessarily trying to say that, but at the very least, I want to show you that there are problems that we can prove are impossible to solve. Now, when you go about doing this, you have to be extremely careful about the methods that you choose to pursue the question. Um, in science, we like to do experiments, and one of the dangers is if we do an experiment and then it fails, sometimes we want to recoup the effort that we put into the experiment and flip around the hypothesis and prove the opposite of what we were trying to prove. And frequently, if we didn't specifically design our experiments to be able to do that, then we actually can't say anything about the hypothesis at all. So clearly you have to use statistical methods properly, but even when you do that, 
you have to, <clears throat> it's difficult to get to absolute um, statements with statistical methods because statistical methods are only accurate to some error bound, to some level of certainty. And even though in theory we can reduce that error bound to zero in the limit, in practice we never actually get there. The second thing I want to talk about um, is what I'm calling philosophical methods, and I'm using the term really loosely here um, to mean just methods that look at the limits of science from outside of science as opposed to from the inside. Um, and there's a lot of different range in what you can do with philosophy, but I want to focus on um, a couple of specific things that can, can lead you into trouble. Um, so there's one um, sort of subfield of philosophy called NOMA, which is um, non-overlapping magisteria, which basically posits that there's some realm of science and there's some realm of spirituality, and there's some dividing line between them and they don't mix. And the problem with at least this particular theory is that it doesn't give you any insight into where the line is. Like you can't know what questions are valid science questions and what questions are valid spirituality questions. And as a result, it doesn't actually give you an explanatory power. Um, so obviously there are a lot more sophisticated philosophical methods and you can fix a lot of these problems. But what I'm interested in looking at is how to demonstrate the limits of science from inside the scientific methods themselves. And I'm going to do that um, with a three-step process. The first thing that you need is a formal system. Um, so this can be something like first-order logic and math, um, or set theory, or any of these sort of foundational systems where we can precisely reason about exactly what we're saying. And the choice of the formal system matters a lot to the question that you want to answer because it's sort of like the language that you're speaking in. And it has non-trivial implications for how you lay out a problem. The second thing that obviously you need to do is you need to lay out the problem statement within that formal system. And there may in fact be multiple ways to state a problem. And frequently when you state a problem in English, it's not actually very precise. And there may be multiple sort of mathematical translations of a given problem, and you have to pick one of those to be able to answer. And sometimes what, how you state the problem may change what the answer is. Um, but um, picking, picking among those is a separate issue, and I'll get to that in a bit. And then finally, given some formal system and the problem statement in that formal system, you can go about proving that there are no solutions to that problem in this system. So the specific area that I want to talk about today is in uh, computer science, is the field of computability, which answers the question, what is it possible to compute? And like I described, we're going to need a formal system, which is sort of like a language for even talking about the problems. The one that we like to use most frequently in computer science is called the Turing machine. Um, <clears throat> it's a formal model of computation that basically models three key characteristics of a computer. The first is computation, which is essentially following a series of rules, like when you see this, do this, when you see this, do this. Um, memory, which is the current sort of state of the computation. And then the input-output behavior, which is how the system interacts with the user. And the interesting thing about this formal model is that it's actually equivalent to a couple different formal models that have been formulated in very different ways. So for example, partial computable functions is a mathematical formalism based on simple algebra and some basic recursion that actually turns out to be provably equivalent to Turing machines even though it looks very different. And for this reason, um, computer scientists believe that Turing machines are actually a pretty good model for what we can do with computers because it's equivalent to all these other different systems. And, the, and one of the key properties um, of programs in these systems is that they can have infinite loops, which means that the programs might run and never finish. And so one of the questions that you might think it would be natural to ask about a program in this system is, can you look at a program for some input and figure out whether it's ever going to finish running or not? 
And perhaps surprisingly, this is a question which is impossible to answer in general. In computer science, we say that it's undecidable, um, which means that you can't take a program and give it to some other program and have it answer whether that first program is going to finish or not. Um, I wanted to go through the proof of this, um, and I couldn't find a really good way of doing it intuitively, and so instead I decided to go through an analogous proof which uses a very similar proof style. Um, so this other proof is called Russell's Paradox, and one way of saying it is that there's a barber in town who's a man who shaves all and only those men in town who do not shave themselves. And the question is, who shaves the barber? Well, if he shaves himself, the rules say he doesn't shave men who, sha who shave themselves. So then that would lead us to believe that he doesn't shave them himself. But if he doesn't shave himself, then the rules would lead us to believe that he does shave himself. And so we, we end up in this sort of circular um, oscillation between the two states, and we can't resolve the answer. Um, so it turns out that the, the proof for proving that um, you can't figure out whether a program is going to finish or not is extremely similar to this proof. Um, perhaps even more surprisingly, you can generalize this to any non-trivial property of a computer program. So any property that takes two programs, or, or like the set of programs, and then like draws some dividing line between them, such that you don't have just all of the programs in one, on one side of the line and nothing on the other side. So any way of slicing the space of all programs is undecidable which makes it really, really hard for people like me who spend their careers on analyzing programs. Um, I'm a compiler writer, um, and a compiler is a piece of software that takes your code and it does a whole bunch of stuff to it, and then it spits out some other thing that hopefully um, runs faster, right? Compilers, um, the main goal of a compiler is to make your code run fast. And in order to do that, you have to understand what the program is doing but I just proved that that's an impossible question to answer. So in reality, it is possible to answer that question some of the time, but the theorem that I just showed you proves that you can't answer it all of the time, and there's no way you're ever going to overcome that hurdle. And so that means that there's no universally effective form of program analysis. Um, so to conclude, I defined impossibility theory to be the study of the impossible rather than the possible, to help us understand the limits of human knowledge and therefore of human capability. Um, and I just wanted to end with one last thing, um, which is it might seem from this talk that I'm trying to beat down the academics for trying to do all this great stuff, and I'm not trying to say that. because. I believe in Genesis we have this really amazing calling that's specifically given to the academics where God creates all the animals and then it says he brought the animals to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature that was its name. And in a lot of ways we're doing that now as academics. We're exploring the world that God created and that is a good um, and holy mission. But sometimes we need to keep in mind that the answers that we're looking for might not be possible to solve. And it would be good to not just keep that in mind, but to actually search for those questions so that we can know the boundaries of our sandbox more clearly. Thank you.